thank you all for being here. Um, it's been a little while since we've done one of these, so I'm kind of glad to get back in the swing of them. So I thought I'd start us off with kind of a warm up one this week about control panels. I'm going to be going into a series about all the different panels that we put in, uh, what their different specs are, what they're capable of or not capable of. And, uh, and then I'm going to try to, in between each of those, try to do some hands-on stuff. So in the next couple of weeks, I'll probably have some of these power supplies that I'll try to do like a live demo, wiring it up, talking about the different connections and that sort of thing. Today's going to be more of product knowledge kind of thing, what panels we offer, what they do, what they work with. And then in the following weeks, you'll get to see some hands-on application. So the first thing to talk about is going to be, we have a couple different types of panels. One is conventional panels. Uh, these are the kind that have been around the longest. They require some kind of trigger to activate them. That trigger can come off of another NAC circuit within the building. Uh, we can get it from a control module. We can have a, a dedicated trigger circuit that comes off maybe the, the main control panel. That main trigger that comes off the control panel can loop around and, uh, and hit each NAC panel that we're putting in these power supplies. Um, the power supplies, they may require a separate sync signal. That's gonna depend a lot on what you're putting in the building, how many different panels there are. If all the strobes are powered off of the same power supply, you will not need a separate sync signal. If you have multiple power supplies or some of the strobes are powered off your control panel and others are powered off your power supply, you will need a signal that syncs the panels together. Uh, all the settings and all the controls and everything are going to be managed through dip switches. Uh, these are just little switches on the board. You might have to have a little trim screwdriver to do it or the tip of a pocket knife. They're, they're pretty small. Uh, the manual in there will talk about how to do it. Each panel, each different model number, the, the switches are going to be different, but that's going to be how you set up your sync signal. Uh, what, what brand strobes are they? Are they Gentex or Wheelock or are they system sensor? So on and so forth because all of those sync differently. Like they use a different coded signal going down the wire. So you have to use the dip switches to set which type of signal is gonna be sent down that wire. And then your circuit configurations, depending on which panel it is, they might be kind of limited. Uh, some of them might have two or three different inputs and you can group the outputs by triggering different inputs. So for a panel that say has four outputs and two inputs, you can group outputs one and two together and three and four together, and you can trigger those separately, or you can have it set up where all four trigger together. Um, another common one, one of the panels that we've put in the most probably, NAC four can be configured to be door holder. So it's always putting out 24 volts. And then whenever it gets an input, NACs one through three will activate like a standard strobe circuit, but NAC four will uh, release the doors. Then the other type of panels we have, these are intelligent panels. Most of our schools we've been doing or anything that has a silent night or Fahrenheit panel in it gets these intelligent ones. They use a four wired data circuit to communicate with the, the control panel. So they don't have a, a separate sync signal. Any signal that's communicating between the two is going to be over that four wire circuit. In the case of silent night or Fahrenheit, that's called SBUS. If you look there on the slide, there's another one I have called P-Link. Um, we've only done one or two Potter jobs, but that's Potter's version of SBUS. It works the exact same way. Two of your wires on that data circuit are going to be 24 volts positive and negative, and then two of them are a, are a lower voltage data part of the circuit. But all four wires have to be connected, even if, say, the power supply gets the 120 volt from the, the electricians, you still have to have that 24 volts in your data circuit for it to communicate. Uh, another cool thing about SBUS and P-Link they can be T-tapped. So when we've talked about that with SLC before or with Class B circuits, if you want to add a device in the middle of a Class B supervised circuit, such as an ACT circuit or a speaker circuit, you have to pull a send and a return wire over to it. You can't just pull one wire over and connect it because you have to actually interrupt the signal path so that it's fully supervised. But with intelligent circuits like SLC, SBUS, and P-Link, you can actually T-tap it because it every single device on there is being supervised at its unique address. So you're allowed to T-tap. And that helps in the field a lot, especially with SBUS trying to get it from one end of the school to the other. It can cut the amount of wire we use in half if, we, if we're doing those T-taps correctly. All the settings in the intelligent panels are managed through the, the control panel via programming. 
there, there's no dip switches for anything like that on board. The only dip switches on most of these panels that are intelligent are just going to be to set the address. So the, the fire alarm control panel knows which power supply or which amplifier this is. And then in that programming, each circuit can be individually controlled, configured, identified, and everything. So it can be set up to be auxiliary power or a NAC circuit or door holders. And you can put descriptions on there. So if you're working in like a building with a bunch of tenant lease spaces, you can say, hey, this NAC circuit is suite 100. Hey, this is, you know, this is the IHOP suite or whatever. So that if there's a problem on that circuit, it'll come up on the panel and tell the service tech, hey, the IHOP NAC circuit has a trouble. So moving on, so a part we haven't talked about that much is the uh, the control module. It looks just like the relays we've talked about quite a lot, but the uh, the terminals are actually different. What this does is it takes some kind of external power or an external speaker source, and it, it duplicates that circuit and puts it out, creating another class B or class A supervised circuit that's based on whatever that input is. So it, it doesn't create any more power. It still uses the power that comes from the original power supply or the original amplifier but it adds supervision to the circuit. So we can use it in like a high rise, for example, for speaker circuits where we hook the amplifier up and we send the amplifier wire up the riser to hit several different floors. And then each floor, we put one of these control modules. So it comes out of the riser, hits the control module, and then goes up to the next floor and hits the next control module and so on for however many floors that amplifier serves. And then coming out of this module, there's a class B circuit so that that can then control the, uh, the, the speakers for that floor, and it'll individually supervise it. We use these to trigger our conventional power supplies. We take auxiliary power off the power supply itself, run it into where it's labeled external power negative and external power positive, and then we come out of the, the class B terminals at the, the bottom left-hand corner, and we go into the input trigger of the power supply, and then there's a spot where you can daisy chain you know, the next signal to the next signal, or where you can land your end-of-line resistor. And then what that allows us to do is it actually not only controls the power supply that we can program over the SLC so we can tell it when we want it to turn on and off in a more intelligent fashion, it also supervises for trouble at the same time because if that power supply goes into trouble, whether there's an open NAC circuit, a ground fault, battery troubles, the power is lost, water gets on it, and whatever else causes the trouble at that particular moment it's going to open up that that circuit between this module and the end line resistor that comes with this module. And it'll tell us, hey, power supply number three in this electrical room has a fault on it. And it, it's not any more intelligent than that. It can't tell us what the fault is, but it can send us to the right power supply. And then when we get there, we can further diagnose what's going on. So this will require two different sources. One, you have to have that external power. I talked about getting whether it's a speaker circuit or that auxiliary power. And then it also has to have SLC. The SLC is how it's going to communicate to your fire alarm control panel. The external power is how it's going to actually provide its control function. Um, I also put a list of the, the different model numbers for working on the different product lines. So if we're working on a game well, it's AOM2SF. If we're working on a silent night panel, it's SK control. Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit's are IDP control. Hochiki's are SD500-ANM. That's short for addressable notification module. The Hochiki one looks a little different than this, but the game well, the silent night, and the Fahrenheit will look exactly like this picture here. And the one pictured is a game well one. So I'm going to move on and get into the power supplies now. This one right here is the one that is probably the most common power supply we've put in on, on any and every job ever. You can see in the pictures over on the left-hand side, it was available with a red and a black cabinet. The, the notifier notifier variant of this panel came with the black cabinet, the Honeywell one that we put in, and the Firelight one that's available over the counter at ADI, Alarmax, etc. They're all that red cabinet that you see above. So most of the ones we put in were all red cabinets just because we're not a notifier distributor. Um, this is the panel that was discontinued this year. So there's a million of these out in the greater Houston area, and they're, uh, they're being replaced with a new series that is the HPF PS series. And they've, they've got two, I'm going to talk about on the next couple of slides, they've got two new power supplies that are going to be going back and replacing these. So this panel had four NAC circuits on it. It's the one I was talking about. You could use dip switches to set up NAC4 to be your door holders. So if you see in the, the picture with the black cabinet on the bottom left corner, 
you have a few different terminal strips. You have one that runs left to right up at the very top that has eight screws on it. Those are your four NAC outputs. Then next to that, there's three more that are kind of offset from it. That is a trouble supervision part where we could put a monitor module or something on there and we could actually supervise it for trouble that way. And then there's a vertical terminal strip down towards the lower right-hand corner of the circuit board. And that is where we got our auxiliary power that would power our control module. And it's where the, uh, the input and outputs would come for the control module. So you could daisy chain multiple of these power supplies on one control module, or that's just where you would put your input and your end of line resistor. And then also the bottom two terminals is your sync signal. So that's where your sync would go. So this is one that requires a separate sync signal from your input signal. There are some conventional power supplies where you, it'll duplicate whatever signal is sent into the input. So if you've got a sync NAC coming in, you just landed on the input and it'll duplicate it. This was not one of those. This one required some dip switch settings to tell it what to do with the sync because you could land the sync signal on there, but if you didn't tell it to follow the sync that was coming in, then it just wouldn't do it. So this is the new series right here. This is the, the HPF PS series. Um, it's available in a red or a black cabinet. Also, gonna, It's also available with six or 10 amps. These are shipping right now from Honeywell, supposedly. I don't really trust Honeywell when they says it's shipping right now. That just means we can order it now and they'll ship it whenever they ship it. So the six amp version has five outputs. That's, that's different from what they've had before. Before that, that last power supply I showed you was a six or a nine amp version. And both versions came with four outputs. So the six amp of this new one has five outputs and the 10 amp has seven outputs. But something we need to keep in mind is that there is no onboard auxiliary power. There's not a dedicated aux power terminal. These boards come with an individual bank of, uh, of dip switches for each output. And you can configure each output individually through those dip switches to be whatever you want. So if we need auxiliary power to trip a control module, we have to lose one of those outputs by turning it into an auxiliary power output, and then that'll power our control module. So the six amp version says it has five outputs, but if we're using a control module to trip it, it really still only has four outputs plus an auxiliary power. If it's being cascaded off of another power supply and it's being activated that way, then we don't have to lose that fifth output for auxiliary power. And, and again, I have the same note on here, may require external sync signal. That's based on the same premise as before. If it's one panel that's standalone by itself and it's the only panel in there controlling all the NACs, then you're not gonna need any kind of sync signal. You're not gonna have to worry about it. If you have multiple sources for your strobe circuits, then it is going to require a sync signal because we will need to sync the panels together. And then I haven't actually gotten to see one of these in person and they don't have real pictures of them out yet. You, you can see the front of the cabinet like I had on the last slide, but that's it. So these came out of the manual that they have posted on the website. You can see how they have the control module mounted on the circuit board. You can see over on the right-hand side that there are three uh, potential inputs for different ways to control it. Coming out of the top, top left-hand corner, we have where the 120 volt lands. Then you have two dry contacts for trouble monitoring. And then this is the 10 amp version because there are seven outputs here, but it's showing that they have that seventh output converted into a 24 volt DC power output to power the control module. Um, and then at the very bottom, you can see there's all those dip switch banks going from left to right. So the, the two different pictures here, the one on the left-hand side is if it's the standalone power supply does not need an external sink, then it's going to look like that. Over on the right-hand side is what how it's going to wire up if it needs an external sink. You can see they have the FACP labeled with the NAC sync coming into one of those terminal blocks. And then they have the control module triggering the power supply from a second terminal block. And they have a note coming off that first terminal block to go to the next, uh, the next power supply or to put the end line resistor there. And then of course that control module still has to have SLC. So I'm going to try to get my hands on one of these sooner rather than later. And so for the hands-on videos, I'm going to try to do one with the old power supply we've discontinued. Even though it's been discontinued, I want to do it with that one because there's so many out there. You might run across one in a service situation. You know, I want some kind of resource there for you. And then I'm also going to try to do one on one of these new ones. I just don't know how long it's going to take us to get one. But when we move on from this, I'm going to move into our intelligent power supplies. So these are three different Silent Night and Fahrenheit models that more or less work the same. So I grouped them together. There's some small differences between them. 
they're all controlled via the S bus. That's that four wire data circuit. And again, it is able to be T tapped. So, you know, if you've got three of them and one's in the middle, you can go to that one and then just a branch to each other one and save some wire. Uh, the 5496, that's the bottom center picture. That one has four onboard NAC circuits, no onboard auxiliary power. One, if you need auxiliary power, one of the NAC circuits has to be turned into a, um, it has to be turned into aux power. Each circuit can be configured to be anything you want it to be, whether it's a strobe circuit, a door holder, um, an auxiliary power, whether that auxiliary power needs to be resettable or non-resettable, et cetera, et cetera. The two on the top are the 5895XL and the RPS 1000. They are almost the exact same board except that one of them works with silent night panels and the other one works with IFP panels. So the 5895XL is the over-the-counter silent night product. The RPS 1000 is the Fahrenheit product. They cannot be mixed and matched. Each one has to go to each specific panel, but they both have the six onboard NAC circuits. Um, they also both have S-Bus repeaters in them, which is great for schools and other jobs with large footprints. Because what happens is the further the S-Bus goes, the weaker and weaker the communication signal gets. So having these bigger power supplies that have that repeater in them help us refresh that signal so that every time it gets to one of these panels, it's being duplicated, restrengthened, and sent, sent out. The 5496 is not capable of that, but the 5895XL and the RPS 1000 are capable of that. My advice for when y'all are installing this, anytime you're installing one of these larger, larger panels and you have S-Bus coming in and out, utilize that repeater just so that you never have to worry about it. The stronger the signal is, the faster everything communicates, the better it'll be for the system. So, you know, even if you've only got six of these panels, and you do that at all six of them or at five of them because one of them has to be the end. It, you know, it might be overkill, but it's not going to hurt it. It's going to be overall good for the system. And then one more note, I didn't put a slide in here for the 5495 panel. It is the exact same cabinet as the 5496. Everything about it looks the exact same, except when you look at how it's triggered, the 5496 has terminals for S-Bus. And the 5495 does not. The 5495 has a conventional input because it's a conventional power supply. Um, that's all I really wanted to mention about that one. The, the only difference between the 5495 and the 5496 is the 95 is conventional, the 96 is intelligent. Then the last power supply I want to talk about is the Potter PSN 1000. This is a 10 amp controlled over P-Link, which again is just like S-Bus. There's six NAC circuits on it. It has the P-Link repeater, just like the uh, other six circuit silent night panels do, fully programmable from the FACP. The one difference between the Potter power supply that it's capable of that the silent night ones don't do is this has two dry contact inputs. So it's kind of like it's built in little monitor modules, which is kind of neat. We don't do a lot of Potter systems. I just wanted to throw this one in there because if you ever do run across a Potter system, there is an intelligent power supply for it. We can get it, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's kind of the end of my spiel on the product knowledge here. Like I said, next week, I'm going to try to have a little demo board set up and I'll start with at least one of the power supplies. Depending on how long it takes, we might knock out two power supplies at once, but that's kind of the end. So if anyone has any questions or anything like that, um, I'd be happy to answer them now if you want to know about how the S-Bus works or more questions about the control module or any of the power supplies. And if there's not any questions, y'all are free to go. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll have this video posted up on YouTube if you ever need to reference back to it. Y'all have a great day and stay safe.